Please welcome Constantine Polychronopoulos and our panel. Does the mic work? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, your perseverance uh, in late afternoon, but we kept the best for last. Um, so I'm happy to welcome here um, Fazil Osman, distinguished engineer at uh, Broadcom. It's Fazil. Fazil. Um, Christopher Moezi, vice president of marketing at Cavium. Christopher. Uh, Dror Goldenberg, vice president of software architecture at Mellanox. Hello. And Sujal Das, chief marketing and scientific officer at uh, Netronome. Thank you. And uh, the topic of the panel is, uh, what else? Smart NICs, the future. So we're going to, um, to have uh, Fazil uh, come up first to the podium. Uh, every speaker will uh, present for about uh, uh, five minutes. And then we'll take questions about uh, anything related to uh, Smart NICs and more. So please, Fazil. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm Fazil, I'm from Broadcom, and what I want to talk to you about is what Broadcom sees as with Smart NICs and why we're doing Smart NICs. So we're the newcomer to the game. Um, Netronome and Cavium have been doing this for years, they've pioneered it, they've made, they've made a lot of progress on it, so now we're entering the market. So what I want to talk about is, real quickly, is why we're doing Smart NICs and then what our model is for, from a software development perspective. So why are we doing smart, why do we get in the smart NIC business? We see the benefits. I think the benefits are getting pretty clear now when you, when you talk to customers, you talk to both um, operators of data centers and to developers of applications, we, we're seeing some of the benefits. So the biggest one that everyone talks about is if you offload the right thing into the smart NIC, you get a better TCO in your data center. I mean, the, the standard thing people talk about, you take your vSwitch, you move it into, into the smart NIC, you, um, you free up CPU cycles. But also, not only do you free up CPU cycles, but you make it a lot easier for your application to be managed because you don't get data moving in and out of memory, you get less, less interrupts and all, all kinds of stuff in the CPU that makes life a lot easier. So, so you know, doing offloads is good for TCO. Um, but the other thing that happens that we hear a lot of now is, is uh, that you get better security. Um, part of the model being that when you move back again to the vSwitch model, you move the vSwitch into the, uh, into the smart NIC, it's hard for an application above it or a rogue user to come in and, uh, and get into your network. So, so that seems to be actually resonating quite a bit with, uh, with developers out there. And also, one of the things that uh, we hear from especially our large customers is about the ability to do faster deployment. It decouples what they're doing from, again, from those applications, whether it be a, a networking application, a storage application, from the, actually, the application that's running on the host OS itself. Because they can go in there from the network, come in, deploy, deploy and do an update, and do it at a different rate than having to wait till that's integrated into the kernel that's running on the host, and what's it released on, the, on that kernel? Can it support this? Can it not? It's, it's, it speeds up a lot of the deployment uh, issues. So that's the main benefits we see out there. However, what we find is that people are having a hard time with picking a smart NIC. I mean, there's so many different models of smart NICs. This is kind of sort of gives you the feel that we, you know, we, if you look at across the board of what we all have here, Functionality changes by, by smart NICs, the cost and power changes, so which ones do you, which ones do you, cha which ones do you use, how do you make the decisions? And uh, that's, that's really, I think, is the, the challenge that we as vendors have to, to solve working with both the, the guys, the, the server vendors and with developers out there to make this happen. So our goal is we want to see smart NICs as a standard SKU in a server. That's, that's the ultimate goal. When you buy your, your server, you go to Dell, HP, Lenovo, whoever it is, you should be able to go in there and say, I want a 10 gig NIC, a 25 gig NIC, I want Rocky, I want iWarp, I want a smart NIC with this feature set, 
and here's what I want, and, and, and that's how smart NIC should come out. So what does that mean? It means it, it has to come from mo more than one of us. It can't be, this is not, you can't just standardize on here's what Broadcom is doing or here's what Mellanox is doing. You've got to look at what, what we're all doing and try and, and come up with models that work for cross multiple platform, multiple vendors. And you've got to put them in standard form factors that fit in servers, you know, PCIe, OCP MES, whatever the latest is going to be in the next few years, that's all we've got to go for. And uh, the way I think when we talk to, to the server vendors, what would make it easy for them to put this in their, in, in their systems is that it just looks like a, a networking device or it looks like a storage device, a block device. And then all the other stuff that's done from a smart that's inside the smart NIC, the application doesn't see, the OS doesn't see, it just sees an Ethernet device, it's an Ethernet device or it sees a block device. I think that making that model of, uh, there is, I think, going to make life a lot easier for us to integrate into the servers. Otherwise, it gets really complicated. They worry about how much they have to test and how do, what, what do they have to know about what, what's going on in the smart NIC. The smart NIC should not be something that the that the server vendor has to worry about what's internal to the smart NIC. They have to worry just about how do you connect it into their server, and then the rest is done by an ecosystem of developers that's going to, do, to make the rest of it happen. And uh, the other thing that we think is really important, especially when we talk to software developers, but I think the, 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 the key for us is to go after software developers who are writing those applications. Again, it's back to vSwitches. We see a lot of stuff also on the storage side where people are doing storage applications is you have to be able to move the application from the host to the smart NIC very easily. And that's, and the reason for that is because people start with their development on a, on a server and then they want to move it to a smart NIC. And you want to de make these, when they deploy it, to be deployed at the same time. You don't want to say, well, you need six months or nine months before you can deploy it. Okay, so we, our model then for how you look at a smart NIC from a sort of a programmer's perspective from the host side, you, you see it as a network, as a standard, standard device, networking or block. And then what you have inside there is a standard server class Linux environment. Really, the, the model that, I mean, we use that term at one time called it a server NIC. There's, a, there's an embedded server inside there. Now, we have all these accelerators. We all create accelerators that differentiate us from each other in terms of capabilities and performance and everything else. But the core is it has, you, you, you want it to be a way it's easy for you to port that software that was running on the host into, into the smart link. And then and there's, of course, the network interface. So, so that's our sort of five minute pitch on uh, our view of, uh, of the world. Thank you, Fazil. Yes. Oh, Christopher. Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, the big guy. Uh, big guy. Big, uh, big, yes. Got it. Thank you. Uh, that, that'll be my turn, I guess. I guess it's your turn. <laughs> oh, bro. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Joe Goldenberg. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, SmartNIC uh, at Mellanox and the way we see things. Um, and I want to give some, uh, some NFV perspective here uh, because we see NFV is one of the key drivers for performance. So NFV, NFV is about packet processing. It's packet processing because we implement network functions and it has to be fast. So li li looking a little bit ahead into the future, looking at 200 gigabit per second, 1500 byte packets, they can generate about 16 million packets per second. And if you're talking about 64 byte packets, we're talking about almost 300 million packets per second. And when you want to process them in software, because NFV is about running stuff on standard commodity CPUs, then we start talking about L3 cache access, how many spin logs I can take and relinquish and, and so on. And that's pretty sane numbers, right? You can almost do a full memory access per packet if it's 1500 byte packets. And if it's a 64 byte packet, you basically have budget for nothing. And all those things really mean that in order to succeed in, in NFV and do some really efficient computation, you really have to look at packet processing with acceleration. And acceleration is becoming must here for NFV. And we saw similar things coming in other markets, like using GPU for graphics, using GPU, GPGPU <coughs> for, for scientific computation. 
And we're also seeing now new chips that are targeting at AI. So acceleration is not something uh, new. And we need to make sure that the, this acceleration is becoming very transparent to the application, starting all from software first, and then accelerating that in hardware. If we look at NFV, and I'm, I want to focus here on the data path, of course, then usually you see the, an infrastructure in place that is running the underlying SDN, switching packets in the hypervisor or the host, and then uh, those packets are sent to the VNFs that can be in VMs or in containers. And this is all about packet processing. It both send and receive in two layers at least and packet processing. And what do we do there? So I threw up a couple of uh, items that people are doing and they can definitely uh, be a longer list, of course. We're doing encapsulation, decapsulation, match action tables, virtual switch, uh, firewalls, IPsec, you just name those things. And since you don't have budget in the CPU, with a dedicated pipeline that you can have in the NIC, you can really accelerate those functions. And just giving some numbers that we have uh, on vSwitch acceleration, we saw ability to get 10x, 10x better packet per second rate at 0% CPU utilization by removing the need to do the switching in the software. Uh, similarly, on IPsec, we managed to do 4x better bandwidth at much, much lower CPU utilization. So all of those things really show the value of acceleration in the hardware. Again, need to make the, this acceleration transparent to the software and accelerating the existing software. But those things really bring value and can make those uh, NFV um, uh, deployment much more cost effective. So I really want to say something about SmartNIC. And it's easier to say what's a vanilla NIC. Vanilla NIC is basically a NIC that has like checksum offload and large send offload. And everybody knows that. And, and, and a vanilla NIC, usually when you start deploying software defined networks, it just breaks. It, you have no offload. You just can send and receive packets. You get all the functionality, but the performance is zero. And then what I see is smart NIC is a whole slew of product lines uh, that are available. And, and you can pick. Uh, whatever makes sense for your deployment. I want to start with the ASIC. The ASIC will have all those offloads. It will be able to do some advanced data plane offloads. It will differentiate between different vendors, but obviously you can do encapsulation, decapsulation, SRIOV. Maybe you can do some security functions, firewalls, IPsec, crypto, and so on. <coughs> and some of the devices do, do have programmability. Maybe it's not so easy to program them. Maybe we should standardize on something like P4 or eBPF to program them. But there is some programmability in those devices, and you can deploy new headers uh, even if you're already up in the field with equipment. And those devices will be the most efficient in terms of power and cost because they will be gate-based and base, gate-based state machine pipeline, and they will be uh, the most cheap, devi cheaper, cheapest devices and um, with the lowest power. And then people are looking at FPGA to enable to enable additional programmability. I didn't mark it as 100% programmability because it's not easy to program FPGA. Don't try it at home. So for every software programmer, <laughs> it's quite hard to program an FPGA. And again, the efficiency is, is very good. However, you do bear a cost of additional FPGA and additional power. Last thing is a smart NIC that is ARM-based. Uh, the, 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 the reason I mention ARM-based because we want something standard, something that can run your operating system of choice. You can run your cell phone application there, or you can, uh, you can run uh, uh, most likely things like uh, DPDK, Linux, and uh, OVS, and all those kind of uh, nice things that we all talked about that can run in the server. They can be uh, run in the NIC. It has a full level of programmability. You can do whatever you want there because it's Linux. Uh, but in terms of efficiency, it will be um, much lower efficiency because you have the baggage of additional ARM, uh, ARM cores. And sometimes if the more functionality you move to the ARM cores, you, you may hit some uh, uh, performance um, uh, challenges. But the last thing that differentiates that smart NIC is the ability to also run the control plane. So you can run things like the SDN, um, SDN stack inside, inside the NIC, or as you mentioned, you, you may even want to run a storage stack inside it. And that creates some decoupling. It can be a more secure enclave for your application to run, uh, for the network uh, virtualization application to run into the NIC. And, and also, it can enable bare metal uh, provisioning. 
that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. And uh, now it is Christopher. <laughs> very good. Very good. So, thank you. Um, my name is Chris Moezi. I'm with Cavium. 30 seconds on Cavium and who we are. So um, Cavium's a semiconductor company that offers software and solutions and adapters. We were founded in 2001. We went public in 2007. We've enjoyed a pretty high compounded annual growth rate growth rate since our IPO, almost close to 30%, and we target multiple verticals with our products. So um, topic of my talk is, is a smart NIC a smart choice? So to help um, up-level this conversation, let's talk about the target markets that smart NICs can, can, uh, can be positioned in. Um, at Cavium, we sort of categorize these in 10 different markets, ranging from hyperscale, data center to enterprise, public, private, hybrid cloud, telco NFE, storage and hyper-converged environments, um, content data delivery, security, um, financial services, machine learning, and high-performance computing. In fact, we've been pretty successful in engaging with a number of hyperscalers over the past several years, and today we're engaged with four out of the, uh, four out of the Super 7 uh, cloud titans and mega data centers. Through those engagements, we've learned a lot, in addition to engaging with a number of security appliance vendors. We've applied those learnings to other segments, including enterprise, NFV, and storage. And we've understood that each of these verticals have their own dynamics. And when you look at different kinds of smart NICs, you can sort of categorize them in three different buckets. Um, smart NICs that are multi-core, um, based, those could be MIPS or ARM based or even RISC based, FPGA based smart NICs, or even GP GPUs that are smart NICs. Each of these types of NICs have their own benefits and merits and demerits and are useful depending on which of these markets you're targeting. Each of these markets themselves have particular characteristics, like NFV, Telco NFV has the characteristic of high performance, small packet count, 64 byte packet um, requirement. Hyperscale data center has the dynamics of having a lot of DevOps teams. There's a lot of um, proprietary development that can be done there versus Telco NFV that there's a huge reliance on open source software uh, and cloud management uh, components like um, OpenStack versus mega data centers that would develop their own code because they believe in developing their own cloud management um, software stacks to get the scale. So um, to date, we have been able to ship north of a million smart NICs since 2012 when we first got associated with one of the biggest hyperscale data centers. And since then, um, we continue to ship into different markets. So when we look at some of the value propositions of smart NICs, as was mentioned by one of my, a couple of my colleagues before at, from Mellanox and Broadcom, um, the biggest value is offload. So imagine you have a smart NIC that supports 10 gig uh, functionality, and you want to offload OVS, which is a pretty popular um, offload. Um, this value proposition was very early understood by the hyperscalers, because they realized in order to be able to get efficiencies out of their servers, they need to go to virtualization. In order to take advantage of virtualization, they need to be able to switch between the VMs. They could have used external Tor switches, but an alternative to that is to bring that switch in soft switch form OVS or variations of OVS, proprietary variations, and run that inside the smart NIC in order to offload those CPUs. So imagine OVS run in a kernel takes about six to eight cores versus the 14 cores that you'd have available in a single socket Intel processor. When you use a smart NIC, depending on whether you do control plane and data plane, um, in our case, we do both, we could save all those cores. Now, when data rates go from 10 to 25 or from 40 to 100, the problem gets exacerbated. And on top of that, when you have additional functions like encryption, decryption, and security that you're bringing into the server from the perimeter, then you end up losing almost double the number of cores that I'm showing over here. So imagine losing 12 to 14 cores out of a dual socket 14 core Intel processor, you've lost half of your compute, which is just not acceptable. So the idea is to use smart NICs so that you could improve your VM density, reduce your cost, 
and increase your utilization factor for your servers. In fact, we've done some analysis on this to sort of see that if you were to deploy a smart NIC in conjunction with an L2 basic vanilla NIC and essentially have the same number of VMs, assume about, let's say, a single rack of, of uh, four VMs per core, 14 cores, you're going to basically have uh, <coughs> 2,000 VMs per core, 2,000 VMs per rack, and you'd see in this graph we show that you can get about 40 percent um, better CapEx efficiency and 35 percent better OpEx efficiency when you use um, a smart neck. So looking under the hood, what does a smart neck look like? And what's the anatomy? So basically you have an SOC that runs on an adapter and you've got multiple layers. Those layers can be a combination of L2 NICs plus RDMA functionality that gives you low latency transport. Built on top of that you've got network and server virtualization functions that do your things like VXLAN and Geneva offloads. This could be a multi-core CPU with a number of OD different kinds of APIs like ODP, DPDK, ABBF, and and P4 or XDP. And on top of that, you have data planes, data planes like OVS, new data planes like VPP. And if you're targeting storage for disaggregation, disaggregated storage, you're looking at NVMe or Fabry acceleration. And on top of all that, you have a huge ecosystem of open source software, hypervisors, and operating systems. So think of it as a platform for accelerating innovation. And one of the challenges I see here is as a community of, soft, of, of smart NIC vendors, we should be able to simplify this and pre-integrate a number of these functions into smart NICs to simplify uh, life for app developers so that they can develop their apps and be sure that the data path that those apps rely on would be accelerated to its max efficiency. So what can we expect coming next? I think that the value of smart NICs will be appreciated more and more with the transitions to higher speeds. I think that they can be um, used to scaling out architectures and bring security from the perimeter of the network into the server, especially with the advent of things like IoT and autonomous driving. And lastly, I think that things like certifications that can help accelerate the adoption of smart NICs by software suppliers can help build trust in the end user community as things like container apps, telemetry, and standardization around virtual machine and VM migration get solved. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And Sujal. Thank you. All right, um, so moving on to the last uh, section here before we open up for questions. Um, so I'm going to talk about success factors. I think a lot of these points were touched upon, but I'll get, get into more details on some of the specifics uh, around uh, uh, the deployment success factors. So, so I broke it down into six legs, and I'm, I'm going to talk about each of these uh, one by one. I think the first one that you see on the left is, uh, is, is the entire ecosystem of hardware and software players that's helping the SmartNIC ecosystem thrive. Uh, there are multiple healthy initiatives going on in all the three areas that I'm showing here. Uh, firstly, hardware suppliers, and all of us are sitting here. Uh, welcome to Broadcom into the community. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a smart and it's a good, healthy ecosystem of hardware suppliers available today. Uh, on the, on the um, software ecosystem side, there are multiple initiatives going on in Linux.org, for example, in the area of uh, OVSTC for enabling offloads into smart NICs. Uh, similarly with the IOVisor eBPF, uh, JIT compilers are being built to offload eBPF uh, bytecode into smart NICs, for example, as well as other uh, software such as Open Contrail that uh, support offloading into smart NICs. So the software ecosystem is growing, and also there are many commercial uh, solutions available today that actually offload into smart NICs, uh, uh, and, uh, and these use uh, open source uh, projects, for example. So the ecosystem is, is robust and it's growing uh, rapidly. Of course, being driven by some very mainstream use cases that you heard other gentlemen talked about, uh, I believe, uh, you know, Network virtualization obviously is 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 a, is a killer app for uh, for this uh, for smart NICs, especially when you go to data rates beyond 10 gig, you know, 20, 25 gig, 1500. 
uh, and uh, uh, my colleagues have, uh, sorry, my panelists, my partners have spoken about that a lot. But two things I want to highlight even further is the, the ability to do distributed security and telemetry, uh, being able to do those close to the VMs in the servers, uh, being able to do those close to the containers, are, are, are other killer applications that ride on top of network virtualization or even in bare metal uh, servers. So these are core uh, emerging uh, use cases, uh, as well as uh, microservices, as we heard a lot today uh, around eBPF, layer seven proxies, uh, being able to fire up uh, new data planes uh, for containers uh, as needed and take them off, for example. And being able to actually uh, uh, apply those to uh, the efficiencies of smart NICs. The third uh, leg that you see, which is uh, balanced silicon architecture. This is, uh, this is very critical uh, for all of us to understand. Uh, we have been doing smart NICs at Netronom for a while now. And uh, it's, it's smart NICs are different from traditional NICs. Um, uh, besides the CERDES and the MAC that you have, and the PCI that lets you get the packets in and out of the host, uh, there, are, there are some new things in a, in a smart NIC, such as the processing cores where you actually run the data plane, whether it's the OVS data plane or uh, eBPF uh, bytecode that you offload to, as well as access to memory uh, that uh, could be on the smart NIC, and access to hardware accelerators. So all of these have to work in tandem, and uh, the weakest link in this could kill the performance. And this kind of showed up a little bit uh, in uh, drawer slides, for example. Uh, but the point here is that having uh, 50 gig, 25 gig, 30s and Mac is not sufficient. The data plane has to be able to run at the right packets per second performance through the entire system, which includes the packet processing cores on the memory. Fourth leg uh, of, uh, of, of the success factors is availability of open data plane software. Um, there are many different uh, Linux-based uh, data plane available today, starting with Open vSearch, Linux TC, IP tables, etc. Uh, some of these are kernel-based, some are user space-based, and uh, the, the important thing for smart NICs here is that the interfaces for offloading have to be upstreamed, they have to be standard, and they have to be same across multiple vendors. That's what will make uh, ease of use for, for end users uh, possible. So, so there are multiple different kernel, kernel versus uh, user space options here. As, as far as Netronome is concerned, um, we are, our, our mantra is that uh, you never bet against the kernel. So <laughs> we, we focus on the kernel. That's why I highlighted those. And our focus is, for example, uh, in terms of offloading, is uh, OVS using the TC uh, packet filtering mechanism in the kernel, or uh, using uh, eBPF XTP. Fifth uh, point I'm making here is balanced software architecture. So there is control plane, and then within the data plane, there is sometimes something called soft, uh, sorry, slow path and fast path. Right? For example, in the OVS architecture, you'll see a slow path and a fast path. Uh, where, where you run these uh, makes a big difference because when packets come in and go through a smart NIC and go to the host or go out through the other port, uh, there's a lot of interaction that goes on between the fast path, slow path, as well as control plane. And how they are placed uh, between the x86 uh, server on the host and the processing cores uh, on the smart NIC, and the smart NIC could have different kinds of processing cores. Uh, and, and how you place those is, is, is criti also critical. Finally, um, there's a notion of uh, single-threaded uh, you know, uh, performance versus multi-threaded performance. So some, uh, some applications, such as the fast path uh, in a data plane, could benefit tremendously from a multi-threaded uh, processing uh, environment. Very similar to what you see in the, in the world of AI with GPUs, uh, where uh, doing some of these functions in the GPU just makes sense compared to doing it in a single-threaded uh, general-purpose processing environment. So these are uh, key uh, balanced architecture, uh, software architecture points that are important in delivering the right level of price performance that one would expect from a smart NIC. Finally, programming. Uh, that's of course, is, is very important. Um, and uh, there are many different ways of programming, uh, as uh, other folks have uh, just pointed out, uh, you could program with C, uh, you could program with P4. P4 is very easy, it's abstracted uh, to the point where uh, from a, for a network uh, uh, designer, programming in P4 is just natural. Uh, 
And then um, there is evolving uh, programming methods such as LLVM, using the LLVM and using the ABPF JIT compiler to actually write code once that goes into the kernel. You heard a lot of, lot of, lot of that today. But using the same concept of a JIT compiler that is available on the Linux uh, kernel to enable user space code created using the LLVM to go into the kernel, you can also transparently get those code into a smart NIC. So what this means is, basically I call it the holy grail of programming, is that you're programming uh, data plane code that goes into the kernel dynamically, and it can also be accelerated if there is a smart NIC sitting on the server. And you just write code once and you don't know where it's running. It just automatically runs in the right place. So all in all, vendor agnostic programming is very easy. At, at Netronome, we are focusing heavily on enabling C and P4 on top of a JIT compiler LLVM um, uh, uh, framework to enable uh, ease of programming uh, with smart NICs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sujal. And uh, with that, um, let me take the first question, and we're going to open it to uh, uh, all of you for uh, uh, questions you may have on this very important topic. I like to be a little bit controversial. It's late afternoon, so let's uh, you know let's throw a question there that is uh, uh, that is somewhat controversial. <laughs> Not controversial. It's it's uh, it's philosophical, I should say. Um, I, I'm, by the way, I'm a very strong believer in smart NICs and the future of uh, smart NICs, especially with respect to NFV and 5G uh, requirements. But if we look at this, uh, it looks like as if we are ch chasing our tail. Uh, and what I mean by that is we, we, we try to pull uh, functionality off the host processor, off the host CPU, put it on the NIC, uh, simply because uh, we don't want to, we want to avoid the memory copies, we want to uh, bypass the bottleneck of the PCI bus, the, the system bus, et cetera, right? So bring the processing very close to the network interface. It makes a lot of sense, right? Um, so why not bring the host processor on the NIC as well? Because we do packet processing, then we go to layer 7 to do processing there. Why, why start pushing content up to the memory uh, instead of bringing the processor on the NIC? And that's what I mean by chasing our tail. Then we have a NIC server. So is that, does that I make anything? I think that's what we're building, that, right? That is what we're building. <laughs> and that's what we're building. So we let's get... We're Let's running. Get, we're running ARM 64-bit ARM, running standard Linux. Exactly. So why do I need? Why, why do we need then the uh, but the motherboard? The, 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 the motherboard is there because the applications that typically run on your server, not uh, you know, let's say you're, you're one of the big guys and you're doing search. I mean, a multi-core, highly multi-threaded x86 is the right platform for doing that. Uh, an embedded ARM that we put, even though it's a server class ARM, is not the right platform for doing that. You won't get the same performance. If you try and optimize for that same performance there, then your power and your costs go up. So I think we, we optimize what we do, and I think we all do, I'm not talking about just Procom, we optimize for what's good for doing network-based kind of applications, not to run an application like search or, or you know, machine learning or anything that you're running on a Mm -hmm. on a server where you want highly multi-threaded uh, capabilities. Okay. Anybody else? So uh, one of the biggest uh, benefits of a smart NIC is, uh, I think what both Chris uh, and, and Dror uh, showed, is how many CPU uh, cores you are consuming doing networking on the server, right? Uh, I, I think there was some data shown, and we have seen as many as 16 uh, to even 20 cores taken up uh, uh, on the server doing networking such as what we talked about today. And, uh, and, and, and some, it, it's important to note that it, it, the moment you have more entries in the tables, uh, whether they are flow entries, uh, you know, the, the performance uh, goes down significantly. Therefore, it's not just a, a matter of getting uh, something that's on the host across the PCI down to a smart NIC, there's more optimizations that need, need to be done in the smart NIC. Yeah, my yes. question though is, is why don't you bring also the host CPU onto the NIC? Mm -hmm. 
There are things that the whole CPU is good at yeah. Yeah. and was optimized for so many years for, for doing this and so many applications have been tuned yeah. for doing this. So there are things that make sense to offload in a NIC and right. things that don't make sense. Let's take one example, IPsec, okay? It so, so much makes sense to, to, to decrypt and encrypt the data on the fly. Why would a server mess with it? So right. you don't even do it in the ARM. You can even do it in, in hardware, state machine, and pipeline, no, sure. and all of that. That, that, that. that really makes sense. And if you see that every application that deploys a smart NIC needs IPsec, mm -hmm. so just put it in gates in, 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 so, in that machine. Exactly. So, so there's this concept of serverless, which basically right. means that <laughs> you know, I don't want to have to pay for things that I can't monetize. So I think one of the best use cases for, uh, for SmartNICs is to essentially offload functionality that then relieves enough cores so that bare metal suppliers, hosting companies, can actually then host applications by other companies and be able to right. then monetize that. Absolutely. Perhaps I didn't phrase my question right, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, let, let's open it. Because if you have uh, essentially you know, uh, unlimited uh, uh, you know, throughput uh, uh, system bus, and very low latency memory, you just put more cost CPUs there. Mm -hmm. And you do everything right there. Right, so, but let's uh, take the first question from the audience. I sort of had a similar question. Um, modern systems, at least some modern systems, are mo moving towards interconnects that are cache coherent. So you create what you're talking about, Constantine, which is really symmetric access to to core memory from CPU right. or right. an offload mm -hmm. accelerator. Um, first, how critical do you see that in the smart NIC space? And Th then there is absolutely no reason that when we have cache coherent interconnects, that smart NICs won't be connected to a cache coherent interconnect. Mm -hmm. I understand that. I'm, I'm wondering how critical you think it is to, to the value of, of smart NICs? I, I don't think, I think there's lots of applications that don't need it. I think there will be applications that will need it, but I think today, I mean, we, we talk about things like, uh, like uh, OVS. I mean, the OVS offload is the, is the typical one. You don't need cache coherency for that because that's something which you can run totally autonomously or self-contained inside the smart NIC. But uh, later on, you might want to do applications where you are processing stuff on the way out and sharing data with the application. But we can't do that today, so I think we can't go after those applications. When those cache, cache coherent interconnects, like whether it's C6 or whatever it is that comes out uh, are there, we'll, we'll move in that direction. But, but there's enough, I think, today. We see enough today value without, have, without needing that. It, it can help. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I believe that you know, as you have you know, lar you know, larger networks, a lar large number of users, more containers, more policy rules, larger tables, um, the, the, the need for a cache currency with, with the host memory would, would increase, I believe, at the speeds and feeds that we're at today. Uh, on the servers, uh, you know, pretty much 10 gig going to 25 and maybe some 50. Uh, it's, it's becoming more important, but as we go forward, uh, as the scale increases in terms of table sizes and, and bandwidth requirements, this will become much more uh, of a of a critical need going forward. Yeah. For, for, for classical I.O., sending and receiving packets, or even doing storage, the basic stuff, like writing and reading a block, you know, PCI and, and whatever I.O. traditional model works perfectly fine. I think, you know, cache coherency will become for more intimate application acceleration that will go even beyond I.O., or where, I, where things start to blur a little bit uh, if you look at things like uh, um, a storage class memory and other things where the I/O doesn't re mm -hmm. doesn't look anymore like a classical right, but that's right where uh, smart NICs uh, yes. are, are going. Yes, yeah. and and the I/O buses are evolving in that way. You yeah. mentioned uh, Fazil mentioned C6, C6 and yeah. uh, PCI will evolve uh, over exactly. time, and they will enable those new paradigms. Mm -hmm. I think we just need your favorite server vendor, <laughs> server CPU vendor to. Right. To you support know, it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to I mean, that's really the issue for us, right? I mean, we can put it, putting it in there and supporting it and be able to do it. The question is, how, what's the whole ecosystem that would. Right. So, so more than that, you're going to see more I.O. coherency. So you have yeah, IO open coherency Cappy is and from IBM or C6 and uh, Gen Z. These are all examples that we will find on SmartNICs going forward. 
to enable that kind of coherency? Yeah, I, I, I believe, that, that just to follow up, to capitalize on that question, that's a good, a good question. I, I think that, you know, if you look at uh, the evolution of uh, virtualization cloud computing, right, we tend to uh, put more and more functionality on the virtual machine and the hypervisor, right? So we are moving towards a space where the virtual machine itself has virtual switching, firewall, customized firewall, and, and a bunch of other networking mm -hmm. functionality that now you are asking to rip off, rip mm -hmm. away, and put it on the NIC, right? That is going to create a source of inefficiency that needs to be addressed, right? Mm -hmm. How much the NIC, the smart NIC, is going to give us a boost and how much it's going to slow us down because of this ripping it, apart, yeah. uh, let alone the complexities, complexities in software engineering, etc. Yeah. So that's, that's a good question, but I think so, we see more and more. Can I ask a related, <laughs> okay. the reason I was asking that question was for a different reason, um, which is I'm trying to understand, I, under, I, like, I totally get the offload switching down to, to hardware. Um, but I think it becomes really interesting when you have higher class services like uh, network functions that are pretty complex. And that's why I was wondering, what, I think the programming model is critical and I'm trying mm -hmm. to understand where you see the balance of right. sharing memory and, and kind of this, mm -hmm. th that blurred line sure. of application versus hardware exactly. acceleration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for the question. Okay. So thanks for the presentation. Um, We've been playing with smart NICs and we see the value and all your use cases are very relevant. The challenge we have is there's four vendors on the table at the table and each one's got multiple smart NICs and everyone's programmable slightly different. So to support that becomes incredibly complex. That's correct. You all talked about the need for standardization, but you seem to be talking about it in silos. When are we going to see some standardization to help mm -hmm. us poor consumers of these things sure. have an easier life? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who wants to take the question? I can huh? start. Um, yes, it's so it's a very valid, uh, valid point you're making. Um, uh, so I think uh, the the uh, there's al there's always a trade-off between you know just going completely general purpose and you know C programming that you're used to in x86 and taking it all the way to SmartNIC and then you lose the efficiencies, right? Um, so so I. I at Neutronome, our belief is that uh, if you abstract it out to a higher level, you know, P4 is a is a is a good example. Uh, if you if you extract it up uh, on top of uh, an LLVM uh, eBPF JIT environment, uh, you're letting the the task of actually placing the code in the smart next to the vendors, and you focus on programming at a higher level, and that that can help bring uniformity in how, uh, how a smartness can be programmed in the future. Mm -hmm. my, my answer in two words is maybe Linux and open source. I think that will be, that will be the standard. The way we look at acceleration is, is, is accelerating the application. So without any mean to torture our customer, we just want you to write the very same software and if there is offload down there in the card, mm -hmm. it will immediately get offload because it's running the Linux and we'll exactly. take care of all the underlying plumbing of make sure that it happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Exactly. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll take one more question. We're running out of time, so a quick question, quick response. <laughs> so actually, my question is a follow-up uh, from, from the previous question. So more than standardization is how you can make, now that you have all this programmability and you have all, the, all this like programmability from the, from the network into you know, uh, the smart NICs, into the data planes, uh, how you make that programmability accessible to the user? How you can make it easy to the user? So, you guys talk about P4. So, what, what's what's your stand up on P4? And uh, you know, what are you looking looking into your roadmaps? How do you see P4, you know, being supported going forward? So, so for, uh, yeah, our, our model for P4 is, uh, you know, we, we we run a Linux Linux environment inside inside our, our chip, and. Uh, we can run uh, XDP eBPF inside there, and uh, P4 can be pushed down into into uh, into XDP. Mm -hmm. So we we see actually that extension of the. I mean, P4 is for the network. Uh, SmartNIC sits on the edge of the network and the server. And I think what SmartNICs do, especially when you have the ability to run a Linux kernel inside the SmartNIC, you you can cross it. You can be on that boundary. We can use XDP to do P4. We can do other things. Even within XDP or not XDP, so I think we, we it's a it's a great 
Linux running on there is, is our answer. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's thank our panelists and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.